Welcome to Two Wheels. This week I'll be showing you some of the latest products to hit the motorcycle market. Later we'll be joining Wayne in his warehouse where he looks at some of the things that we like to bolt on to our motorcycles. But first we're joining Jeff at this year's World Ducati Weekend in Bologna in Italy. Ducati, yes Ducati, regular viewers will know I actually love the things, but that's by the by, it is a charismatic name and you can't get away from that, and Ducati themselves recognise this, and in fact over the past two years they've ran the World Ducati Weekend in Italy, this year though they've extended it to a whole week, the World Ducati Week. What's it all about? Well I asked Luke Plummer, who's a UK PR and marketing man, what it was all about. It's a celebration for us really, for, uh, for all uh, owners and Ducatisti around the world. Um, this is the third event we've run now, um, but this is the first time the event's taken a whole week. Um, we ran one in 1998 and in 2000 and in 2002. So it really is um, a celebration for everything that the brand stands for, from classic uh, and vintage bikes through to modern racing bikes and even design, etc. It's very important for us to run such a such an event, um, and and in the past in the past two years we've run it as a weekend, and there's certainly been demand to run it for a, for a full week. Um, there is a, a massive amount of passion associated with our brand, um, and um, and it's a great way of getting the enthusiasts and um, and everybody who's in, in love with the brand together to celebrate this. We can uh, with with the weekend we're able to. Um, get together many different areas of, of, of the brand um, from, from early racing through to, to current world superbikes um, and even of course the, um, the launch of the Desmo Sudici GP bike. Now you've never seen so many Ducatis in all your life. There were literally thousands of them, 30,000 owners at least came there and they had every model you could possibly think of. That unique clutch rattle just echoed throughout the whole weekend. Absolutely fantastic. You could just absolutely lap it up. You could drink in the atmosphere. Monsters certainly seem to be the number one fave in Italy because there were absolutely hundreds and hundreds of those and they were all tarted up in one way or t'other. You had anodized this, titanium bits and pieces here, special paint schemes. There was even one in leopard skin, which I didn't think much of, but nevertheless, the owner was pleased with it. Naturally, as it's a World Ducati week, they've got people from all over the world there. And each of the big owners clubs, they had their own stand there. So we've got people from North America, Japan, Austria, New South Wales, Hungary, in fact, from all over the place. But I caught up with the Brit, Dave Birch from Cheshire, and he told me what it was like to ride down from good old Blighty. Well, we started from back home. We had a 150 mile ride up to Hull uh, to catch the ferry over to Zeebrugge. Um, and that's when the weather started really and then um, for one day the rain was horrendous all down the autobahns um, all the way through Belgium it nothing but rained all day and you've never seen rain like it. Riding in the sun can be a problem but you've got to take precautions towards it. You've got to prepare yourself for the extreme heat when you get down here. You've got to prepare your bike more thoroughly and, and check it all over before you come. Um, Looking at the heat on the mountain passes and the way we ride and we've ridden the mountain passes, one or two could have done with a bit of a brake fluid change or something before we set out. The ST4, it's, it's a crack, it's been belting for the journey. The wife's ridden pillion all the way down. Some of us clocked up now, getting towards 2,000 miles, including the ride from home. And um, the wife thinks it's great. I'd like to show you something brand new now. Here it is, not the helmet, no, but the name on the helmet, Arashi. A brand new name, you may never have seen it before. Certainly fairly new to me, I've only seen it recently. Comes from the Far East and that name, Arashi, is actually taken from the Japanese word for storm. But that's totally irrelevant to what I'm gonna tell you. Brand new helmet manufacturer, as I say, tri-composite design. There are, would you believe, over 124 layers in this shell of fiber, carbon and Kevlar. 
So uh, pretty uh, high-tech stuff. It's got all the usual features that we're so used to seeing with helmets now. Decent sort of ratchet mechanism on the visor. The liner is all removable and washable. The fastener is the seat belt type that sort of clicks in so you've no messy buckles to, uh, to undo. So nice and easy to get on and off. Uh, loads and loads of different shapes and, and styles now in this. Let me show you this one. This one's called the Tornado. Visor mechanism, nice and simple to get off. When you buy these, you get a little tool. It's got two little prongs on it, two little pins that sit into these little holes here. And then you just turn that. I've actually loosened this one to make it easier. And then it's just a case of unscrewing that. And then the visor clicks off. Nice and simple, he says, like that. There you go, and you can swap your visor. Obviously, you wouldn't be going around with the black one, would you? This one, this black one, is called the Mono. And one of these will cost you £170. This is actually like exactly the same helmet. It's called the Tornado, but it's in a multicoloured design. Slightly dearer, another ten at 180 quid. Now, the thing that makes these helmets special and unique is that they can actually claim to be the lightest helmets in the world. They're lighter than your RIs, showers and AGVs and all that. And I'm speaking from experience because I've been wearing one of these and you can tell the difference. They only weigh 1,340 grams. So there you are, a new name. Loads and loads of different shapes and sizes and designs of these things start from as little as 90 pounds. That's for one that has a flip up front. So if you fancy one of them, it costs you 90 quid. That one, as I say, 170, that one 180, and they go right up to 230 pounds. So next time you see these on your dealer's shelves and you see that name, you will know all about it. Do I look a little bit blue to you, eh? Well, I'm all right, actually. I'm not blue at all. I'm not in the least bit depressed. In fact, I'm more than happy, especially when I'm spending your hard-earned cash on your machines. And that's what the subject matter is of today on Wayne's Warehouse. Spending a load of money on something you don't really need. There's an example. OK, it's a nice blue screen, and it fits on a GSX-R, and it happens to be around 30 quid, but it's exactly the same shape as the original. It doesn't actually serve a purpose. So, if you are going to spend your money on something, Pay a bit a little extra like that, 47 quid, and get one with a double bubble, as they call them. That raises the draft above your head, makes it a little bit more aerodynamic, a bit more pleasant to ride fast on a long journey. OK, subject matter is spending money on something you don't really need. Well, this is slightly contradicting in terms, really, because this is a hugger. Huggers do protect your rear shock absorber. This particular one isn't particularly expensive, 60-odd pounds, colour-coded to your bike. But there are people who will put on something posy like that, a carbon fibre version. Now that costs quite a bit more money, well over £100, does the same job. So that is pose. Real pose is buying a front mug guard, for example, like that. You've already got one on your bike, you need one by law, covering the front wheel up. Buying a carbon fibre one is extra cost, unnecessary. Real unnecessary cost are when you buy a carbon fibre one and paint it to match your bike. That's total pose, isn't it? There are these things, which are mirror covers, carbon fibre mirror covers, 40 odd quid. And all they're doing is going over the plastic cover that's there in the first place. That is pose. And you know, for that amount of money, you don't even get the glass. So you can't even do your hair or anything. You know, so it's a bit no good to me. Man, yeah, having said that, it's perfect anyway. <laughs> Tri and Vertical Twin started in 1938, but if we came up to the early 60s, 1961, this is a Speed Twin, 500cc, now unit construction, gearbox there, heart-shaped timing cover there, very important that is, a Triumph trademark, complete with this little badge there. But as I say, this is a 500, two cylinders of 250cc. When they wanted something bigger, what did they do? Well, they went to 650cc, but they also wanted a 750cc. This is Triumph Strident, in fact this is the, the last of the range, the T160, finished production in 1977, but this is the three cylinder Triumph. So you can recognise that heart shaped timing chest there, unit construction gearbox, it's now a five speeder but that's by the by. But as I said, what they did here is actually develop the engine, they simply took a 250cc cylinder and literally stuck it on the end. So now you've got one cylinder here on the right, another one in the middle, they've got twin exhausts on it but that's more of a fashion thing to go around this um, frame tube, then the other cylinder on the right, so that's three 250cc cylinders, making all together a 750cc. But not sufficient with that, they actually wanted something bigger still. So what did they do? They simply cut off another cylinder and stuck that on the end, and I'll show you that one now. 
Yeah, this is it yet again. That heart-shaped timing cover, this one probably looks a bit different to you because in fact this one is a BSA version which was a bit different. The Rocket 3 this is based on, but the engines were basically the same. So what started off as a 500, then went to the 750, now has gone to a 1000cc with another cylinder on the end. And how did they do it? Dead simple and a bit crude really. They simply sawed a piece off the crankcase, sawed another piece off the other crankcase and stuck the two together and welded them together straight down the middle there. And the same as straight up through the barrels there. Now even though the 750 performed incredibly well and beat MVs and all this sort of thing, this was just a one-off prototype made in 1969. But what they ended up with, unfortunately, was an engine which was too big, too complicated and too heavy. Far better, I think, to start off with that clean sheet of paper. That's all for part one, but still to come after the break, I'll be showing you some of the latest bits and pieces to hit the motorcycle market. And there'll be more from this year's World Ducati Weekend. Welcome back to Two Wheels, still to come, the very latest bondage attachment for motorcyclists. All will be revealed. But first, we'll rejoin Jeff in Italy, where he chats to some of the riders that have made the long journey from the UK. I've got a foggy rep, uh, Jeff, uh, but it's not suited to long distance and of course couldn't ride it all this way in comfort. So we brought it in a van with a friend of mine, split the costs, get here in one piece, save on tyres, save on um, maintenance and extra servicing costs. And of course, you know, it's more comfortable to get down here. You don't have all the bad weather. That's it, you unload it, you're fresh, you're refreshed, you're ready to go. So yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. Talking to people around here though today, a lot of people have come down, brought the bikes in the trailer or in the back of a van. And I think that's, you know, probably the, the majority of people here today have done that. And it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, we couldn't have wanted better weather. It's got to be 30, mid 30 degrees. Absolutely fantastic. The atmosphere is electrifying. I mean, just look at it. This is my first visit, it was a weekend last time, we didn't make it then, but we've made it this time. Thoroughly enjoying it, it's a great place to be to see Ducatis from all over the world, not yeah. just uh, just Europe, but also to meet people that you know, um, even even vaguely through the owners club. So it's it really is a good social occasion. I rode down uh, from Leicestershire uh, to Dover on my 888, and uh, across on the ferry, and then Calais, uh, through France, Switzerland, um, over the Alps and into Italy, and it was uh, good fun all the way. What do you think these are? No, they're not love handles. It's actually part of a device that goes around my waist called the Pillion Pal. You've probably all seen these, many of you are probably using them now. Fantastic invention, been around actually for five years now, and it's been developed, or it was originally developed, by a company called R&C Products in Birmingham, who are still very much alive and still uh, doing a good trade on these things. There are some coming in from the Far East, but they're not the original ones. These are the original ones made in England. And uh, it's dead simple, isn't it? Goes round your waist there, clicks in, nice big sturdy fastening on the front, and your pillion rider can sit behind you and hold on to them like that. So it makes them feel nice and safe and secure, gives them a good, uh, a good grip, and also, more importantly, it lets you know, you the rider know, that they're still on, because if that goes slack, you know that they've disappeared off the back. So, a great invention, I think so anyway. But some people have said, 
What if you want to take a youngster, your young daughter or your young son on the back of your bike? These are very big, these handles, and their little hands with the gloves on just get a bit lost. Well, they've thought of that, they've addressed the problem, and they've invented this one now, which is exactly the same. Still called the Pillion Pal, but it's got mini grips on it now, and you can see the difference there. That's the standard sort of adult size grip, and look at the difference there. That's the mini grip for a, a child or a youngster. Not only is it smaller that way, but that gap there that the hand has to fill is actually a lot smaller as well. So your youngster can sit on the back, feel nice and safe and secure, and once again, you'll know that they're there. Fantastic invention. So you've been around for five years. They'll cost you 15 quid a piece, these, and I think they're great value for money. I just wish I had thought of it. I wish I had invented it. Let me show you something else. Have a look at these. These are earplugs. Nothing new there, is it? We've all seen them sort of squidgy foam air plugs that you screw up like that and you wind them in your ear because we all know that many hours in the saddle with lots of wind noise in your helmet will damage your hearing. It's a fact. You will go deaf eventually. So, you might not like them. A lot of people don't like them. They're a bit sort of fussy, aren't they? Messy. So, what if you want something else? Well, haha, we have something for you. This is custom made air plugs. Look at these here done by a company called Ultimates who are in Kent in the UK and these are custom made earplugs and what you'll do is you go along to these people and they stick a load of stuff in your ear and they get a mould of the inside of your ear like a dentist does if you're having uh, false teeth fitted and all that they get a mould of your ear and they'll make you an earplug custom made to fit your ear they actually do them in different colours you can pick your own colour why on earth you would want to pick the colour of an earplug that's going in your ear under your helmet I really don't know, but I suppose if you want colour matched earplugs, you can have them. They'll cost you 45 quid. You might think that's dear, but think of it this way. If you crash your bike and smash it up, you can have it fixed. It'll cost you money, but you can have it fixed. You go deaf and damage your earring, no chance. You ain't going to get it back. So there you have it. If you fancy custom-made earplugs, indeed made-to-measure earplugs to protect your hearing, now you can have them. So that's one new product, and there's the other one. A pillion pile now with mini grips. There they are. We're in the heart of Wales, we're actually up on the fells near Raider and there's a real good reason for it and it's my passion, off-road motorcycling. In fact we've come to a motocross meeting but it is an event with a difference. I'll tell you about that in a minute, for the moment I'm watching. <laughs> It was a famous boxer that was, so Lewis. And where are you from? Bukasani. That's near here, is it? Yeah. You're a real Welsh then, aren't you? Are. Do you speak Welsh? Yeah. Do you not? Oh, I thought I met somebody who talked Welsh. The sun shines on the righteous. A mile away, it's absolutely beautiful, and right above my head is a dark cloud. If you're one of those riders who thinks the riding position of an R1 or a Ducati is a bit extreme and those bars are too low, what about this one? A 1956 BSA Gold Star with its clip-on bars. This is in Clubman's trim as they called it. This was a racer, but a racer for the road. You could also move the handlebars, not actually these, but get yourself an optional pair. On the top yoke here, there's a dummy piece of bar in there, but you could actually put normal bars. This has got rear sets on, but you can move the footrest forward. I don't mean these footrests, but actually buy the normal standard road set, put them there, and just ride it normally. From the rider's eye view up here, you've got a steering damper, which is manual. No fancy hydraulics then, just a friction damper. And you see the twin clocks up here. And these were called chronometric, the rev counter and the speedometer. 
and I remember them they used to actually click round in little stages, nothing smooth about them at all. But it's a beautiful bike and it feels so trim. If you look down here, because this was at a time in the 50s before disc brakes, so you've got a massive front brake there, aluminium front brake, chrome rim, but it looks the business, doesn't it? It looks very, very racy. Interestingly up there, you've also got a front number plate at all, uh, of course. And for you younger people, number plates were compulsory on all bikes up until about mid-70s, 1975. And uh, with all the talk of speed cameras these days, who knows, bikes might actually get them back. Because with forward-facing cameras, they can't catch you, can you? There's a thought for you. What else have we got? You can see the big air-cooled engine here. This is a 350, all alloy. They made a 500 as well. It looked just the same. This off here is a rev counter drive, mechanical of course, this is before electronics. Separate four speed gearbox there and the gear change of course on the right hand side. But perhaps its biggest trademark was this big chunky exhaust and the gold star silencer at the back which always had a little twitter. I wish I could fire this up and then you'd hear it. That's all from Two Wheels for this week, but on next week's show, Jeff travels to Lincolnshire to meet some young, very creative, up-and-coming motorcycle engineers at this year's Youth Bike Project. I'll have what could be the ultimate gadget for bikers, an onboard GPS navigation system, and Wayne will explain why race replica helmets are very often over £100 dearer than a standard one. That's all next week. <laughs>